Hello and welcome to lesson two. In this lesson, I will demonstrate how to construct this flowing dragon design that you see here. I'll be focusing on using expressions with properties like scale and position, which were not covered in much detail in lesson one. Also, we'll cover some new concepts and expression terms, so uh, let's jump right in and get started. I'm going to start with two 100 by 100 squares in a new comp, one white and one red. I'll select both of these and hit P to show their position. In the previous lesson, you created expressions for the Y rotation value mostly. Position was only lightly touched on. Now, I mentioned in lesson one that simple calculations can be used as expressions like 10 plus 10. However, if I create an expression for position on the square here, and I type in 10 plus 10, I'll get an error. Why is that? Well, values like opacity, or perhaps 2D rotation, or even that Y rotation value you were working with, are what we call scalar values. Scalar values have one number that define what they are, like opacity or rotation. Rotation, even though it's degrees and revolutions, this is still essentially one number that defines what it is. However, in the case of position, this is what we call an array. An array is one property that contains multiple values that are independent of each other. So 2D or even 3D position have multiple values like X, Y, and Z. And we need to account for all of these values when we create expressions for them. To properly define the values of an array in an expression, the contents need to be surrounded by brackets with the individual values separated by commas. So to create an expression for this white square that would define the position to be 300 and 200 in X and Y, I would type a left bracket, 300 and 200 separated by a comma, and then a right bracket. Now, as you've seen, we probably wouldn't use numbers like this. If I wanted 300 and 200, I'd just manually enter it over here. I won't need an expression to do this. Power of expressions comes from using dynamic values, like the ones that we can obtain from using the pick whip, perhaps. So for an example here, I will make this red square move in the opposite x direction of the white square, just so we can get some basic groundwork before we move on to the dragon. So I want the red square to move in the opposite x direction of the white square. So to do this, I'm going to create an expression for the red square's position. And I need to start out with a left bracket. And now I'm going to pick whip just the x position of this white square. Notice I can just pick whip x or y. And if I release, it's going to type the code that I would need to enter to retrieve just this x position. Now I'm going to multiply this, because I want it to move in the opposite direction, times negative 1. And as you've seen before, I like to put negative 1 in parentheses, just so it makes a little more visual sense. So this is our x value right here. This is all one number. So I'll separate my x and y with a comma, and I'll enter a fixed value for y. I'll just use 320. And I'll close this off with a right bracket, and hit Enter and our red square disappears. Well, where does it go? Actually, let me zoom out. We'll see that it's out here. It's actually doing exactly what we asked. It's moving in the opposite direction. But because this line right here is the zero mark in X, this area out here is the negative area. So if it moves in a negative direction, it's going to move out this way. So what we need to do is offset it back over and put it over here to put it in our field of view. So I need to add a little bit more to this value right here. Now I'm actually working with a comp that is 1024 by 768 so I can zoom it full screen for you guys. So what I would need to do is add back in 1024. However I wouldn't actually recommend doing it this way although this will work just perfectly. I'm going to teach you a new term. Instead of using 1024, I'm going to use this comp period width. This comp dot width 
retrieves the width of our current composition. So if you are working with 720 width or whatever your width is, this comp width will be independent of your composition's width and get the absolute width of your composition. And this will work just fine. So if I move this white square around, the X position is moving in contrary motion. This is very cool. Now let's take a look at this right here. This expression to me is starting to look a little cluttered. Personally, I think expressions should be something that can visually be dissected easily, especially when they start getting very lengthy. And this right here looks a little sloppy to me. I can see that I've got several values here, but I have to kind of hunt with my eye to find where in the heck the comma is. Oh, it's right there to figure out where my x and y values separate. This is just not the kind of uh, expression that I would typically program. So to simplify this, I'm going to use something called a variable. Now a variable is a container within our expression that can be used to store data like numbers or arrays or text or calculations. Once we define this container, the container can be used repeatedly through the expression. Think of it like a pronoun, like he, she, or it in a conversation once we establish who he, she, or it is. So to use a variable, let me first drop this down one or two lines. I first type the variable name. I'm going to use x, or I could also use something like my variable 2. Variable names can be any combination of text and numbers without spaces that are not found in the expression language menu. So anything that you see in here, you cannot use as a variable name. So I'll just stick with x, and I will set x equal to something. This is how we declare a variable. I'm going to set x equal to some stuff over here. And that stuff is going to be all this stuff I typed out down here. I'm just going to cut this and paste it up here. So now x will be equal to all this stuff and then down inside the brackets I can say x is equal to this and y is equal to 32. This makes a lot more visual sense to me than what I had before. You can look at this and visually at a glance see what's going on. Now there's one catch here. Anytime I declare a variable like x is equal to something I need to, at the very end, put a semicolon. It's just a JavaScript thing, don't lose any sleep over it, but you have to do this, otherwise you will get errors in your expressions. So x is equal to all this, x is now this comp, blah 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 blah, and y is 320. This still works just fine, like it did before, but this makes a lot more visual sense to us. Now don't get caught up in the fact that I use x as my variable and I'm using it for x position. There's no direct correlation between the variable name and how it is used other than the fact that we will tend to want to use something that makes sense in terms of our organization of the expression. But I could use anything as this variable name as long as it is used down here inside the array. Also notice that I do not need to type anything like position equals this to have it actually tie into our position. In fact, this would give us an error. What we're trying to do is set a variable using the word position, which is reserved, and setting it equal to something else. We don't need to do this. Expressions are calculated progressively from top to bottom, unless we specifically interrupt that flow from top to bottom with other terms that we'll learn later on in this training series. But right now you can assume that this expression will start at the top and go all the way to the last line. And this last line will become the value of our property. And because this last value is a valid array, this will get plugged right into our position value. So I don't need to say position equals something. Don't forget expressions can only modify the properties in which we are using them. So it is redundant to even try to say position equals something else because we cannot define anything other than position in this expression. All right? All right. All right, so let's get around to constructing that flowing dragon design that I was talking about. I'm going to grab the head of this artwork, which is included with this lesson, so you can use it on your own. And I'm going to scale it down. 
Now what I want to do is have this head become the basis of the motion of the entire body. So I'm going to create some expressions on the position of this head that make it flow along the screen automatically. So I'm going to create an expression for the head. I will create a variable named x and I'm going to pick whip its own position value. What this allows me to do is actually have a modifiable value. So it's getting its own x position. In fact, if I close that with a semicolon and do the same thing for y, y is going to be equal to its own y position. And I put a semicolon, and then in brackets, I put x and y and pass that array off to this position property. We'll see that this is a completely modifiable and keyframable layer because the expression is passing its own position value back through the expression. Now the reason we want to do this is that I can add things on top of this. So I can still keyframe this and move it around, but on top of this we will have some oscillating motion up and down. And that's actually going to be in the Y axis. So get rid of these keyframes. On top of this Y here I'm going to add something that we learned in the last lesson. This was the sine function. So if I type math dot sign and I am going to type the word time. So this is an oscillating value between 1 and negative 1. So if I enter right now it's going to oscillate up and down one pixel in each direction. Not very dramatic. If I hit play, in fact you really can't see anything. But what I want to do is multiply this so that it will become a much greater value and in fact I'm going to use 250. So now if I hit play the head is moving up and down on its own. It's very cool. It's going a little bit slow, so inside here I'm going to increase the rate that it moves by multiplying time by, let's say, 3. So now it's going to move a lot quicker. But this is still keyframable, which is very cool. So if I move this off frame, set a keyframe for position here, and move it through the screen. Hit play. It's moving on its own. Now what we need to do is set it to auto orient along the path by right clicking, selecting transform, auto orient and say orient along path. I'm going to reduce this amount just a little bit by 50 so that we can see what's going on here. So the head is now orienting along the path. Very cool. From here I need several trailing body segments and this body segment looks like this. It's a little big so let me scale that down quite a bit and drop it below here. I'm going to look at the position of this body segment. Now what I want it to do is follow this head but delay it a little bit. So I'm going to start off just by creating a, an expression and pick whipping the head. So this is going to move in the same time and space as the head. Not quite what we want but it's getting there. I also need to auto orient this so it moves along the path like that getting closer. But what I need to do is say look at it at a different point in time. And actually I can do that if at the very end here I tag on something that is called a method in our expression here. This is a or property method. If I say value at time, we're going to change how we're looking at this position. So instead of looking at it right now, I could say look at it uh, at three seconds. Or I could say look at it at the current time minus a little bit. I'm going to use 0.2. So it's going to look at it 0.2 seconds ago. So it's going to offset it by a little bit. So let me back this up and play this. So the position is now offset in time by just a little bit. So I need several of these body segments. So I'll just duplicate this segment here and I'm going to look at this one below it here. Now what I could do is I could keep 
manually pick whipping this layer above and adding this value at time. But what I can do is recycle this expression over and over. Actually, what I'm going to do is focus on this section right here. When I say this comp, which is our global object, and then the sub object is the layer. So I'm saying looking in this comp for a layer called something in quotes. There's another way I can refer to a layer, and I can actually refer to a layer by its layer number. This is called the index. So for this layer here, index is equal to three. Here, index is equal to two. This is index one. So rarely do we do this because if I add another layer, it's going to change the whole layering number. But in this case, what I want to do is refer to the layer immediately above it. So in this case, index is three, and I want to look at two. So I'm going to follow the position of the layer above it. So what I can say is index, which is a proper expression term, index is the layer number in the stacking order, and I can say index minus one. This is always going to look at the layer immediately above it and then delay it by 0.2 seconds. So if I add another one of these and keep duplicating, these are all going to be offset just like so. Now at this point, it would be great to scale these down a little bit as they progress further down the body. So what I'm going to do is delete all of these except for the first two segments. I'm going to leave the scale alone on this first body segment. I don't want it to scale down. Scale is fine. It's this one right here that I want to start scaling down. So I'm going to hit S to show my scale and I'm going to create an expression for the scale here. Now, what I want to do is set a variable. I'm going to use s, and this is going to be equal to the index. Index, again, is the number of the layer in the stacking order. So in this case, index is equal to 3. Now, I'll leave that alone for now, and we're going to drop down to the next line, and what we're going to hand off as the value of scale is its existing scale, because remember, we've scaled this down a little bit, so we need to actually in this case subtract a little bit from the existing scale value. So just like before when I pick whipped its own value I could do this and grab that but pick whip is kind of a crutch. We're starting to learn more and more about expressions so let's get away from using the pick whip in this case and I'm actually just going to type the word scale. You'll find that scale will work just fine. The word transform is actually a little bit redundant and the transform word comes from pick whipping it. Technically, yes, we could put transform.scale, but scale will work just fine. Now, in this case, scale is equal to a two-dimension array, x and y. So scale has two values. So if I were to subtract something from this scale value, I would want to subtract another array from it, because otherwise it will act a little bit erratically, because I need to subtract two numbers from these two numbers. So I will subtract an array that is s and s. So in brackets I've just put s and s. In this case this is equal to 3 and 3. So 39 and 39 minus 3 and 3 will equal 36 and 36. If I wanted these to scale a little bit more I could multiply this times a number of maybe like two, so it decreases just a little bit more. Now if I keep duplicating these as index increases, it's going to keep subtracting values from the scale. Now I'm seeing that uh, I might want to shrink the value at time up just a little bit, so what I'm going to do is delete these body segments here. I'm going to select these two layers here. I'm going to hit EE to show my expressions and I'm actually just going to go to this one right here. These first two layers are pretty large but the ones that get progressively smaller I want to shrink up just a little bit. So I'm going to make this time 0.13 and this still has my scale expression on it. So if I close this up 
and duplicate these. These will be a little tighter and not so much space in between them. And they are all scaled down over the course of the body. Now the one last thing I'm going to do is make one more duplicate, select this layer, grab the tail element, drag it down, hold down the Option key or your Alt key in Windows, and replace that last layer with the tail. Now if I play this, we've got our flowing dragon. And how many keyframes do we have? We have two whole keyframes in our entire project for this immense, complex, organic motion. Very cool. In our next lesson, we'll focus on this 3D text composition here, and we'll use After Effects to construct some 3D looking text, and we'll also be able to sort of fake some reflections and make some nice looking 3D text without using any third party plugins whatsoever. So we'll be focusing more on position arrays and how to add and subtract them together, and we'll do some other design elements. So uh, I'll catch you in lesson three.